Um, well, it was great to see so many here. I thought we might have uh, an empty hall with the, the golf on this afternoon. Um, see, even Robert made it. He was threatening to, to disappear off. Um, I suppose, again, yeah, just going back to the title, um, what I'm basically trying to argue is that it's not just uh, technical skills. It's actually designing the people's needs front and centre into policy, so the public interest to, to be designed into uh, policy making. And I think over the, the last seven years, in, you know, repeatedly here and elsewhere, we've heard about all the, the myriad of problems and the way the policy process works in Ireland, sometimes to the detriment of all of us. And we know that short-term outcomes are often prioritised over longer-term outcomes, Difficult and important changes are often shelved, and good reports and recommendations can gather dust. And at the same time, we also know that the interests of vociferous lobby groups, as Pat so eloquently put it in the, in the last section, often trump the interests of the, of the public, and policy making often lacks transparency. Um, and as we also heard in the last section, our national politicians, people, a fairly puny parliament, with their own power too often being used uh, simply for amoral localism, as Peter Mayer memorably put it. And as a result, the government tends to prioritise and be shaped by the concerns and needs of particular groups or ge geographic areas, rather than the people as a whole. And the overall result, as Neve Hardiman in UCD has consistently pointed out, is that policy development is generally poor at strategic long-term planning. Um, one answer lies in transforming the management ability and competence of individual people, the technical skills that the title refers to, but another is in actually changing the way we do planning and building it around the needs of citizens, putting the needs, putting the public interest, putting the, cit the citizen front and centre in policy creation. Um, one of the, uh, I was interested, Joe put uh, Fukuyama in the, uh, the little blurb about this session, um, so I thought I'd better speak to him a little bit. And we know he declared in 1992 the, the end of history. Now, of course, that statement now provokes a, a lot of uh, criticism, but it's not entirely fair. His basic argument was that there's no alternative to capitalism and democracy. And, of course, some do try, not only ISIL and Putin, but also advocates of post-communism. I even saw Channel 4's Paul Mason setting it out in The Guardian at the weekend. Um, but nonetheless, the world, including Ireland, is still getting to Denmark. And getting to Denmark was Fukuyama's shorthand phrase for an effective, accountable, tolerant and law-bound society. And the three principles which he argues are the foundations of a, such a decent polity are an effective state, the rule of law and democratic accountability. And he argues, and so do many others who, who followed on from, that developing all three in tandem is difficult. Too much of one can stymie another. It's a difficult balancing act. And moreover, there's the probability, perhaps certainty, of decay. And as we all know, it's easy for bureaucracies to decay, to become self-serving. And they primarily do this through intellectual rigidity and regulatory capture. And on the one hand, those they regulate use their democratic accountability and the rule of law to get their own way over the years. So we have a twin problem. We have bureaucracies which seek to maintain control and power, even when it is not in the, the general or the public interest that they do so. And we have regulated entities trying to ensure that their regulation is as light touch as possible. So I want to try to apply those thoughts to Ireland and examine policy through Fukushima's lens. So first we know that technical competence, and this is really Eddie's area, is, is too often lacking. There is, of course, rule of law, but lawmaking itself can be very problematical, as, no, as Noel Dempsey pointed out there and Lucinda. Um, and there's such a presumption to property rights that many feel that there's one rule of law for the asset rich and another for the rest. And we also have real and serious cultural issues in terms of accountability. So I thought it might be interesting to take sort of three recent examples um, to, to try to exemplify this and talk it through and try to understand what's, what's going on. Um, so the first one is a current one that's been referred to earlier, and I think you have almost a half day on later in the week, as Irish Water, uh, which is an ongoing crisis, which I think was almost entirely avoidable. The second one is financial regulation, which, uh, again, we've heard about and we'll hear more. Um, a crisis from which we're still recovering. 
And the third is a much more esoteric one, which um, I kind of look at in more detail, which is around the, the problems of establishing an electoral commission, which I think exemplifies how even on small stuff we refuse to implement policy coherently. So first, water charges. Um, I think that it's reasonable in an advanced industrial democracy such as Ireland um, that citizens could expect clean, drinkable water. Um, yet in Ireland, tens of thousands of us, as we know, are on boil water notices at any one time. And even if the water were clean, half of it is lost, as we all know, through leaks. So you would think that a system of repairing the leaks, cleaning the water, and ensuring supply would be imperative. And if this could, could have been achieved, I think, um, it's arguable that many would have been willing to pay for it. But instead of that, we ended up with a complete fiasco of uh, policymaking. So again, applying for Kishama's lens, we can see that there were legal problems. The legislation was guillotined through in one evening with little prospect of proper scrutiny to uncover problems. And to be fair, the few questions that were there um, appeared to be more concerned with their own parochial problems rather than with any big picture analysis of the, uh, of the legislation. Uh, but nonetheless, the government gave no opportunity for any substantive examination. They then made legal amendments, as we know, and changed policy to make it worse still. We have a flat rate charge, which fails to raise sufficient funds or promote water conservation. And I think this exemplifies one of the bigger weaknesses in Irish policy, which is the almost absolute power of the government to get whatever measures it likes passed through the legislature, sometimes without detailed scrutiny or debate. And using the party whip system, I have to disagree very uh, vociferously with uh, two of our earlier speakers um, about the party whip system. It's stronger here even than in Westminster from where it derives. You know, to, having a really strong party whip system is not constructive to proper scrutiny or debate or to uh, the legislature being able to hold the government to account. So not only do measures get passed without due attention or amendment, but the Parliament just simply can't hold the government to account. If we then move to competency, we can see that the issue of leadership is crucial. The government chose an experienced local government official to lead, but did he and his uh, team have the competence to do so effectively? Um, my colleague Ona Mali has written that a major problem with water was actually financing the huge investment required in the infrastructure after decades of neglect by all the governments. Doing this off balance sheet simply added to the problems. But the model didn't work. Didn't work excuse me. Um, it priced water at too high a price, took too little account of the ability of people to pay, or to fostering the necessary changes in culture, and it simply sought to bulldoze it through. The bottom line, I think, was actually the need to maintain the bureaucracy that was the water service, and this was prioritised over the needs of the people, all of those of us who consume water. And this is despite the fact that the agency spent some 50 million on consultancy fees. So it would seem clear that these consultants didn't prioritise the principle of policy which should be putting the needs of the people front and centre when designing that policy. If we then turn to transparency, the third of his principles, we know that for the first months of the crisis, Irish water management was simply nowhere to be seen. They just sent out their communications director who became a household name. Um, how decisions had been arrived at between Irish Water and the then Minister remains murky and unclear. And indeed, it was some time before the body was even opened to FOI. So the second area that I want to look at is the Electoral Commission. Now, I know this probably seems a little esoteric, even to this august audience, but I think it typifies policymaking and demonstrates why we find it so hard to modernise our systems and adopt best practice. I'll just take a quick moment to set out the background the establishment of an electoral commission to subsume the functions of existing bodies and the Department of the Environment was one of the measures that was set out in the programme for government. Perhaps that phrase, subsume the functions, is the secret to understanding why nothing has been achieved. Among the public, it's essentially non-contentious. It got 97% support of the Constitutional Convention. Yet the Department of the Environment is only now conducting a review, a measure which nobody I have met will result believes will result in a single substantive action, um, perhaps because a bureaucracy does not easily yield power or authority. In other countries, such as Australia, an electoral commission manages the register, conducts the elections and referendums, educates and informs 
provides research advice and assistance, administers funding, financial disclosure, party registration, shapes electoral boundaries. In Ireland, we have SIPO, the Standards and Public Office, which covers some of these, while governments establish ad hoc referendum commissions to handle referendums and other ad hoc uh, bodies to deal with boundaries. However, responsibility for running elections, including registration, is local, while research and funding is almost entirely absent. And the result is ineffective policymaking and a lack of coherence. So we don't even know what turnout was at the recent referendum. We have a published result, all right, but our registers are poor. People are struck off for no obvious reason. People are on multiple registers. Others remain on registers when they die or remove overseas. Light touch regulation on funding in elections doesn't work properly. I and uh, colleagues Theresa Reedy, David Farrell and uh, Fiona Buckley have recently made a submission to the Department of the Environment if anybody's interested in the detail. But suffice to say, I'll not be holding my breath to see any changes whatsoever. Finally, if we turn to the banking inquiry, day after day we can see Irish policymaking failure writ large. Again, looking, using the same framework and looking first at the law, we see that the light-touch regulation designed to attract global bankers and funds here rather than to London or Luxembourg fail completely. As Michael Lewis, a member, put it, people panicked when they saw the little man who was meant to be in charge on their TV screens. And as near his own testimony at the inquiry made abundantly clear, there was almost complete regulatory capture. Quite simply, the banks were running the show. But there was also clearly a competence problem. A strong regulator, even working through light-touch regulation, could have made stronger demands of the banks, acting as a regulator rather than an enabler. A competent Taoiseach could have asked bankers about banking when on a golf outing in the midst of a banking crisis. A competent system would have listened to the voices of dissent rather than advocating suicide for dissenters. The examples here could, and I'm sure will, fill many a book, but suffice to say that the Irish financial policy system lacked proper competence at almost every conceivable level, managerial, regulatory, political and economic. Again, the issue is the system was there to protect the interests of political, financial and administrative systems and was simply not designed with the interests of the people at centre. If the people had been the focus, the possibility of banking collapse and socialising losses would have had to have been guarded against as a matter of central principle. And it's almost trite to suggest there's no accountability. It's only now, some seven years on, that we're even hearing people give what are usually self-serving accounts of their actions. Um, there's a clear sense that Fine Gael, having the inquiry close to the election, would remind voters of Fianna Fáil's starring role in crisis creation and incompetence. And as a result, the banking inquiry is not really a forum where we do get interesting nuggets designed to find out what happened. It's more there to push blame around. So where does this all leave us? I think it's clear that we're still travelling towards Denmark. We have problems in all three areas where one can outweigh the others. If we take one at a time, it's not so much the rule of law that's our problem, but our lawmaking process. The overweening power of the Cabinet, which can mean laws get passed without sufficient scrutiny or amendment, is very problematical. In addition, the constitutional protection given to property rights has led to a myriad of problems. For example, a good deal of corruption has come to light in land rezoning, rent reviews, housing shortages. The Kenny report, as far back as 1973 on land rezoning, recommended changing the strong constitutional protections afforded to private property where the public interest is at stake. But nothing has been done to change that law. In terms of competence, we've myriad problems, as has been argued elsewhere. Better outcomes can be achieved by better trained people with proper competencies. And Ireland has fallen behind the British system on which our civil service is based. Um, other parts of this are being addressed. But it's the processes and the systems which need to be upgraded. I think one interesting area is the Stanford Design Ledge approach, which advocates that a process should start by taking on a deep understanding of the customer. In many ways, this is the managerial process akin to the deliberative and participative ones in political science, such as the Irish Constitutional Convention, which seek to put the citizen at the heart of decision-making. And in this way, democratically mandated reform should have this design-led approach, with an understanding that innovation should emanate from a clear understanding of the needs of the customer, or for our purposes, the citizen. And I think this is entirely possible to enable the design a better government where we can observe what, what is the will or the needs of the people. Um, I think one of the bigger 
cultural problems with accountability and transparency is the Official Secrets Act. Even the most junior civil servants must sign this anachronistic legislation. John Coakley and Michael Gallagher have argued that Irish political culture can be defined as deference to the views of established leaders and intolerance to those who dissent from those views. Contributing to this has been a breakdown in the interface between Ireland's public institutions and the public and a presumption of secrecy that's underpinned Irish government since independence. The Official Secrets Act was enacted in 1963, simply replacing older British legislation, and it placed much greater emphasis on state security than on openness and transparency. It applies to all civil servants and potentially anyone within the state. It's punishable by up to seven years imprisonment, which I think produces a chilling effect on any tendency towards openness. It includes not only cabinet deliberations, um, but the information on the working of public bodies. Um, and it simply isn't present in most European countries which function well without it. I think Sir Humphrey might have put it best in an episode of Yes Minister where he said that uh, the Official Secrets Act is not there to protect secrets but to protect officials. Now, of course, there have been really uh, good moves in terms of uh, accountability from Brendan Howland and Robert Watt, who I see over there at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform open government initiatives, freedom of information reforms, whistleblower and lobbying legislation. But there is much more to be done. We, we need to understand that trust in politics and political institutions is at an all-time low. We need to act. For first steps, I think we should empower the Parliament. We should make sure we put the interests of citizens, not bureaucracies, at the heart of policy planning. And we should make every effort to, put light, to let the light in. And I think doing so in a transparent, clear way might even engage younger people that Noel was talking to us about early, earlier, who are searching for new ways, of doing th new ways of doing things and have a strong preference for something other than the status quo. Mind you, I wasn't particularly encouraged by a couple of our speakers later for any particular moves. There's some uh, departments, there's some state bodies who are beginning to walk the walk, and perhaps others will start to follow suit. We need to hope that they all do.